Hi, everybody. I hope I'm audible. Can you all hear me? Good morning, good evening, folks who are joining. Adona is saying hello uh, to everyone here. Thanks for joining uh, this uh, exciting day. We've done a lot of work over summer. And now I think it's time to present all of our work and vision going forward. So thank you all for joining uh, today. We will be going over narrating local stories through the lens of the SDGs, um, which is a part of the Eco Ambassadors uh, uh, program at the Center for Sustainable Development. And we'll go over what we did for summer uh, going forward. And we have a great set of panelists here who are, uh, who will be sharing their experiences as we go on. Thank you, Adona. Quick note before we start, uh, if you are on the phone recording the webinar, it is a webinar and it will be showcased on our YouTube channel. If you are uncomfortable, please switch off your camera. Uh, also, since it is recorded, it will be great if you can keep our uh, 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 videos, keep our uh, mics on mute because it will help to keep the, uh, um, we can hear the sound uh, properly as well as if you have any questions, there is a chat function, please feel free to in the chat as we go along. So just a quick brief on Eco Ambassadors and our partners. We uh, work in a cons with a consortium of programs. We have SDGs today. We have uh, ESRI. We have RGI Story Maps, uh, which is a part of ESRI, uh, which is uh, also a big component of why we are here today. SDGs today and ESRI have partnered to give us this uh, story maps, which are fascinating. And we'll go over the story maps that we created over summer. Uh, we are so privileged to be working in partnership with the uh, worldwide uh, climate teaching as well as with the Arizona State University's Turn It Around cards, and we'll hear from them very soon. This entire program, along with the Eco Ambassadors, is run at the Center for Sustainable Development, and we have uh, Mission 4.7 as a, as a partner entity here. Brian has raised his hand. I'm not sure if we can do any questions yet. I hope it is audible and we can go ahead and then we can do questions as we uh, go along. Uh, Eco Ambassadors program is uh, in a brief nutshell uh, is a combination of science training and citizen science and advocacy uh, work. So we are working with scientists to focus on the science training component uh, we work with uh, a lot of scientists at Le Monde at Columbia University to focus on the science training part, which is also citizen science work that we are engaged in. And we want to use that science for public knowledge. So we do that through our eco advocacy, through our storytelling uh, formats. And here we are uh, at the intersection of sustainable development, where we are focusing on science training and Eco advocacy as we go along to focus on sustainable development with justice and uh, sustainability at the at the center. So that's our program goals. Today's agenda is a full packed agenda. We have lots and lots of people who are here uh, joining us who have been a part of the summer program, and we are here. Uh, uh, we'll start with the Eco Ambassador Story Maps. Uh, we'll do a panel discussion with Story Maps with SDGs. Today, Mariam Rabi will be showcasing her ideas on Story Maps and how to create a Story Map. We have uh, ESRI uh, participants here. So nice of uh, you know them to participate and tell us we've been using the platform so freely and it will be great to have uh, to get some comments from them. We also have... Uh, storytelling and educational tools uh, that we uh, will be hearing about from Anne Nielsen from Turn It Around Cards as well as Janvi Bhatt, who is a creative writer, and uh, Katie and Brewster, who is from Sustainable Earth at the Arizona State University. So she'll be showcasing some of her work. Uh, curriculum development, we'll be focusing on Mission 4.7's educational platform, and then we will be hearing from uh, two fantastic teachers, Ms. Freeman and Mr. Bertolotti, who will be discussing their um, integration of storytelling and story maps in the classrooms as we go along. And then uh, towards the end, but not the least, we have David Blockstein coming to discuss uh, 
this new campaign that they have started as a collaborative together. So they will be joining uh, uh, as we go forward on some action plans uh, as we uh, now complete the summer and go ahead with our academic year. Uh, we have a YouTube playlist. This is also a repository of a lot of material, a uh, lot of discussions in the past, uh, including the summer stories. So if you are new to the group and if you are joining as a webinar and uh, not a, 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 as an audience and not as a panelist in this webinar, be free to look at our YouTube list because it includes a summer program on how uh, the summer program unfolded and how we created a story map. So feel free to go uh, to our 2022 uh, Eco Ambassadors program and you will have a playlist of all the summer work that was uh, that we have done so far. So you'll get a glimpse of uh, uh, how we created these story maps and what are the skills that we learned. If you can go on. So now I'll ask my colleague, Hain Shin, who has been uh, championing this particular program, some of uh, Eco Ambassadors program, has been working at the Center for Sustainable Development for many years. I don't even know the number of years anymore. So she will take over and explain uh, uh, and take over the program. Thank you so much, Radhika. Hello, everyone. It's really great to see you. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And as Radhika just mentioned, this whole series and all the things that we're able to discuss together um, and the content in it would not be possible with all of our students and all our partners. So thank you so much. We thought the best way to start the session would be actually hearing directly from our students who have taken all of the different components of our workshop series and of our Eco Ambassador program and have actually created their story maps. So um, <clears throat> we have. Um, Chan Young Oh, Ria Rawat, and our Bluebell School International team. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining. Arsha Harding, Masweta, Omisha, and also Adona today for joining us. Um, so I'll hand it over to the students. But before we do, um, if we go, can go to the next slide, we wanted to share um, the other all the other story maps that are that were produced this summer as well. Um, so please feel free to check them out. The link is there on the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll get to see how all the different students have adopted and incorporated and applied what they have learned um, into their story map. So with that, we have our first presenter, Chan Young Oh. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Chan Young Oh. I'm a sophomore at Korea International School. Um, I play golf along with table tennis. Um, I like science and math, uh, and my favorite uh, food is instant noodles. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, so for my Eco Ambassador Summer Project, I wanted to tackle a topic that is close to the hearts of everyone in Seoul. That is, keep drinking as much coffee as we do without environmental consequences. The hidden problem, as you relax in the comforting atmosphere of a cafe, you think about the bitterness, the aroma, or the temperature of the coffee, but you never wonder where the grounds used on your coffee end up. In Seoul, Korea, coffee waste usually ends up in landfills where they decompose and release a potent greenhouse gas, methane. By reusing the waste to grow edible species of mushrooms, not only can the waste be prevented from being dumped into landfills, but it can also be reused to grow food sustainably. The 23 mile journey of coffee waste from local cafes to visualize the scale and process of where the coffee waste is disposed of, I mapped every coffee shop within one mile radius of me in the landfill where it currently ends up in. And that landfill is a pseudo one landfill site, the SLS. Though there are over 307 landfills currently in South Korea, there's only one active landfill for Seoul, the SLS in Incheon, covering 14.83 square kilometers, accepting an average of 12,000 tons of garbage daily, along with coffee waste. So why is coffee waste harmful to the environment? An average Korean drinks 12.3 cups of coffee a week with 13,500 cafes in Seoul, the highest number of cafes per capita in the world. 145 tons of coffee waste is produced in Seoul daily, equating to about 70 cars as shown on the right. And according to the Seoul Metropolitan Government, most coffee waste is buried or incinerated. This all translates to about 49,300 cubic meters of methane produced daily, about 16 of this Olympic pool-sized cube 
shown on the left. And as most of you know, methane is a very strong greenhouse gas responsible for over 25% of global warming. So how can mushrooms solve this problem? Mushrooms are part of the fungi kingdom responsible for breaking down organic matter. They're commercially grown on wheat or straw, but they can also be grown on coffee. Coffee grounds are a very good substrate because they are rich in nutrients that are useful for the growth of mushrooms. They contain nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and cellulose combined with an acidic pH. So exactly how many farms do you need? A farm in Belgium called Permifungi recycled 39 tons of coffee waste yearly, producing 12 tons of mushrooms. We need around 1,300 mushroom farms like Permifungi to cancel out the effects of coffee waste. Knowing that there are over 13,500 cafes existing in Seoul currently, establishing one farm per 10 cafes is a very much realistic goal to start a circular economy. Now, the government has also attempted to tackle this issue. In 2018, the Seoul Metropolitan Government launched a project to fix Korea's coffee waste problem. For three years, they collected and attempted to recycle coffee by building mushroom farms and donating it as coffee uh, as feedstuff to local farms. However, they were only able to collect a meager 500 tons. For reference, Seoul produces 145 tons daily and stay dormant today due to a lack of demand. This project is mostly considered a failure. Now that we know the goals we're dealing with, how will we achieve this? There are several, several challenges to this. First, Seoul is too tight a city for an independent mushroom farm. Second, the profitability of these farms are highly dependent on demand. And third, transportation takes immense energy and time. Now the solution to all this, mushroom cafes. Mushrooms cafes is a term I invented to describe cafes with built-in mushroom farms. An example of this is a V&A cafe of the famous V&A Museum of London. This cafe contains a built-in glass mushroom farm behind this cafe where they recycle 100% of their coffee waste. And why would mushroom cafes work? First, they don't need to take up too much space. An entire semi-commercial farm can be built inside a shipping container with an area of 160 square feet, about 15% of the area of most cafes. Second, they are realistically profitable. A full-on farm six times the size most cafes need initially costs $20,000, about one month's worth of revenue. And third, no transport, no, no transportation at all. Not only can cafes eliminate the transportation cost, they can reduce their carbon footprint. So how do you get mushroom cafes started? I have two proposals for this. First, the SMG will award all three marks shown on the left, regardless of the size of the farm or how much coffee a cafe recycles. And second, the SMG will spend $3 million handing $30,000 to the first 100 mushroom cafes for covering the cost of the mushroom farm and an additional $2 million to give $2,000 to the next 1,000 cafe, mushroom cafes, around 6,684,450,000 in total. Though I love coffee as much as anyone else in Seoul would, I wish I could continue visiting the cafes and drinking the coffee I love without feeling the guilt over environmental consequences of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shanyang, for your excellent presentation. I know we probably have a lot of questions for you, but um, let us hold our questions. We will go through all the presentations and then we'll regroup together. Uh, with Mariam. So uh, right for now, we will move on to our next presenter, Ria Rawat. If you would like to share your screen and share your presentation and your um, experience with the story map. Thank you. Go ahead, Ria. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Ria Rawat and I'm from John Adams Middle School in Edison, New Jersey. This presentation is on off-grid rainwater harvesting. And the important question here is, can it delay the day zero of our water crisis? Now here we have a map from NASA, which shows the different areas around the world that are experiencing a water shortage problem. The areas that are in deep red are actually under high water stress. And if we look at the United States, it seems to be like there isn't much of a problem, right? But when we take a closer look, specifically at regions in the West, um, they actually do seem to be experiencing these same issues. Now, when we look at different areas around the world, such as Cape Town in Southern Africa or Chennai in India, they're very close to experiencing their day zero or have already experienced this day. This is a day in which all municipal water is cut off meaning that you get no access to drinking water. 
like when you turn on your taps, nothing comes out. Different areas around the world are also working on solutions to this problem. For example, I did a case study on an apartment complex in Bangalore, India, in which they have created a fully self-sufficient water system. That means all of their water is consumed and then reused. So no water comes in or goes out from their municipal pipe. I've added more detail on the complex here, but I won't go over it in this presentation and you can check it out later. So the average American family consumes far more water than any other country in the world, where we use around 300 gallons of water a day. But other advanced countries in the world, such as Italy or Canada, only use 58 gallons or 86 gallons. So America, what are we waiting for? When I looked at my sprinklers, I noticed that they're throwing drinking water onto our lawn, drinking water that can be used for our daily activities. Grass also prefers rainwater, which has the minerals and the nutrients it needs to grow. And this, is, this actually formed the idea of rainwater harvesting. So in step one, I had to buy a 50 gallon rain barrel, which will collect and store the water. In image one, I am building a base, and in images two and three, I'm assembling the barrel together. In step two, I needed to buy a diverter, and this diverter will actually channel the water that goes through the downspout into the rain barrel. I actually had to cut the downspout here, and I installed the diverter. One problem I saw in this project was overflow, and I took a picture of it here, right here. In order to solve this problem, I, I built an overflow pipe that is connected to the downspout over here. So any excess water that the rain barrel could not hold will go down the overflow pipe and then continue its normal path through the downspout. Another problem I saw was that the water was not coming out the sprinklers with enough force or pressure, so I needed a pump which would push the water out. So two pumps I could have bought were one, the submersible pump and the water transfer pump, which I've added details of over here. And in the end, I bought the second one, the water transfer pump. I also wanted this project to be off grid when I saw that my, my water transfer pump uses electricity from the electrical company, which isn't green, uses non-renewable energy. So instead, why not use solar energy instead? I bought a solar panel and I installed it into the ground. And in the last image, I had to install it at a 31.8 degree angle because this is this is the angle in which the panel can absorb the maximum amount of direct sunlight in my zip code. And the final part of this project was um, the solar power battery bank. The main purpose of this is to store the energy and it's actually connected to the solar panel is to store the energy and then convert it into AC, which is required by my pump. In this image, you'll see that it's charging at 90 watts, the, which is the input. And now we have our, um, now we have our final video, which I'll play for you.
Okay. Should we lead, should we wait to the last drop or should we lead with innovation? Now I know that my one 50 gallon ring barrel alone cannot make a dent and I cannot save our planet. But I do know that if we do this together and we work together, then maybe we can really make a change. Now here I have news article headlines from around the world, including innovation. Okay, um, thank you for your time and that's it. Thank you so much, Ria. Not only did you do a story map, you actually installed the system live. It's a live system that you have installed. It's really incredible. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you, um, but we will move to the next presentation for now and then we'll regroup together. So now if I can ask the sustainable fashion team uh, from Bluebell School International to join uh, Omisha, Arsha, Mashweta, and Hardik, well, over to you. If there's one thing that millennials are starving to consume, it's fashion. Now see, clothing is an unquenchable desire for more, more, and even more. Good evening, everyone. The Fashion Shares team of Bluebell School International is here to talk about sustainable trends in fashion. I am Hardik Madan. Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Amisha Mehra. Good evening, I'm Hashweta. And good evening, I'm Arsha. Well, consumerism has reached unprecedented heights in the clothing industry, leading to increased production that proportionally adds stress to the environmental resource. We have discovered that the root cause of significantly altered consumer behavior are the media promoting clothing as a statement of confidence, beauty and achievement. Fashionable and chic clothes available at cheap prices, often at a price lower than Domino's medium sized pizza. Cheap copies of high-end brands, red sales, blue sales, weekend sales, and Black Fridays that force further indulgence. We discovered that the clothing manufacturing industry leaves a tremendous carbon and water footprint. The production of cotton, the most popular fabric of fashion clothing, releases 220 metric tons of carbon and greenhouse gases. Further, the industry also uses 5 trillion liters of water. We also visited stores that promoted sustainable clothing and met with store managers, conducted surveys to understand fast fashion, problems associated with it, and the solutions that companies have been adopting recently. This map, made using ArcGIS, could you please go to the map? So the map made using ArcGIS includes the location of the mall along with the stores visited. So on our survey to examine consumer behavior in the fashion industry, we tried to analyze the following. First, how often do people buy clothes? Analysis of the survey revealed that 64% of people bought clothes every month, while only 29% purchased them once a year. Well, when it comes to fashion, no one bought second-hand items. Third, 
Renting clothes as a viable option was not acceptable to anyone and everyone preferred new garments. But on a positive note, the survey concluded that 69% of people considered buying clothes made of sustainable material. 72% actively donate their clothes, while 266 have yet to decide what to do with theirs. We propose the following solutions to make the whole fashion industry more sustainable. So first is of course the use of eco-friendly or recycled materials for manufacturing cloth. Second, uh, these manufacturers and companies should recycle and reuse the wastewater that is produced in each process of production. Third, they should create more and more designs that have increased durability and minimum resource exploitation. Fourth, they should ensure that the carbon footprint of uh, the packaging and all the transportation that is involved in this industry is reduced to minimum, for example, by avoiding the use of plastic. Second, they should use natural organic dyes such as turmeric, indigo and others that must be promoted in the market. The last one, that multiple seasonal sales that keep coming up should be curtailed and the pricing should be altered to, to curtail the whole trend of fast fashion. And furthermore, in India, we are proud to share that we have a beautiful age-old practice of hand-me-down goods that was very popular, but afflu affluenza is taking over fast. However, we still have a large population of Indians who need hand-me-downs. Learn from us and understand what we need now is an organized sector that will make sure that clothes do not reach landfills and dumps, but we can wear them again and again. Talking about the mapping aspect, using the ArcGIS mapping feature, we researched and marked states and some places where organic and sustainable clothes are manufactured. Secondly, geographically, we also located places where excessive textile leaching and dyeing of clothes has had impacts on the environment. While keeping the problems of production process in mind, we thought that as responsible consumers, we should do the little bits that we can to promote sustainable consumption and maybe even try to stop it. Therefore, we have created an app called Fashion Shifts with the aim to curb the wastage of resources in the clothing industry. You can uh, see our storyboard to see a detailed version of the app. Is it audible? Uh, it's not audible yet. Can you enable uh, sound sharing, please? Can you please enable the option of sound sharing? Sound sharing should be audible from your side. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, the entire option is being disabled by the host. Oh, so it will be difficult to do it. I, we have it currently for ena being um, enabling the share for, for multiple of the, all the panelists to share their sound. Well, I try sharing. No, the option is disabled. Can I click again? Hmm. Sorry, team. We'll um, we'll it's find. Fine. Yeah, if you can, yeah, continue on. Yeah, I can do that. Can you just play the video and read it out?
Um, hey, I'm sure you have clothing piling up in your wardrobe that you either don't want to wear or they're just out of trend. Well, we've made the perfect app for you where you can upcycle clothing and see your clothing transform into something new and reusable. When we click on the app, we can either sign up or log in. So in this case, let's sign up. After signing up, you will immediately be taken to your new homepage where you can either buy upcycled clothing, sell your old clothing, or look at how exactly we upcycle, reuse, and sell. Let's start with the sell item page. Yes, so we have the, uh, we have the option of uh, adding items that we want to sell. Here, we can give a few details about ourselves. Let's move on. We mention a few more details here and can also specify if the item is torn or not. This is the final step where we can specify which clothing item we are selling to the app and can also upload images of the same. Of the same. So let's say we sell a pair of pants. We get a cash receipt here that we will have to keep saved somewhere for the final delivery. Let's finish the order now and soon a message will be sent to the mobile number entered by us so that we can confirm our pay purchase. How about we buy some items now? Let's look at what's on sale. So we can either buy pre-owned items or upcycle items. For pre-owned items, here we have an assortment of items that were owned before and have been put on sale so that they can be worn again. Second, upcycled items uh, is the store where the app itself suggests reusable and sustainable clothing and other items. Lastly, let us look at what our app does. So we are trying to maintain sustainable fashion before clothing, item, before clothing items that take up too many natural resources that may permanently disappear for too less. So that is it for the app. Our main goal is to create a better and much more sustainable future for the generations to come and prevent nature from being destroyed just for the clothing we wear. Thank you so much, team. Uh, we'll hear from our last presenter before we regroup and ask, uh, go through some questions with all of our student presenters. So Adona, over to you. Um, hello, good day, everyone. I am Adona, a class six student from Bluebell School International. And along with a few other students, we made a story map regarding e-waste. So I'd like to share my screen. So basically we started with a story written by me. And then after that, we decided to add some information regarding data and statistics. So I'd just like you to take a quick glimpse of the entire story map. So um, child labor is truly a major issue, whether they have it in these DG goals or not. When it's just a matter of thought to spread awareness, the trickiest part is to um, completely remove the inhuman act of forcefully depriving a child of their childhood or mental awareness through some physical activity. But we also know that spreading awareness is one of the first steps to thriving in an injustice-free world. Um, when I was younger, I loved listening to the stories my parents told me the stories which taught me the value of kindness, open-heartedness, peacefulness, amongst the value of so many others. Personally, I feel that stories are something through which you can connect with anyone. Stories are things that can bring people together. And I think that that is crucial for the change we are all so yearning for. My biggest takeaway from the Eco Ambassador program is that the world is full of diversity, which makes earth beautiful, which makes us beautiful. And that to solve any issue that we are facing, all we need to do is bring these different cultures together, honor age old traditions, as well as remain in awe of the ceaseless amount of mysteries the world contains. 
And of course, to rethink about all aspects of life before calling ourselves developed. We must remember this, that nature has more mysteries and facts. And I think that the crisis is not just a crisis of global warming or poverty or plastic, among so many others, but the crisis within us, humankind. Children are the future. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for those reflections, those really insightful comments. I think this is a perfect segue for us to bring our student panelists together um, and to talk about your story, Max, and what it meant for you to go through this training um, and also in your career you. and sharing your story. So if I can invite our partner, Mariam Rabi, if you can join us now and um, just briefly introduce yourself and also you know, moderate these thoughts um, and, the, and, the, and the students and their reflections in the process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Miriam Rabi, and I lead the SDG Today program at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to uh, partner with the Inco Ambassadors program. Uh, this is our second program. Uh, and we're very excited about how students uh, utilize geospatial information and tools uh, to, to communicate their, their projects and their research. Um, I wanna start by congratulating all of you. Those projects and story maps were absolutely incredible. Uh, not just the story maps themselves, but the fact that you offered four very practical solutions that all of us can, can integrate into our daily lives. So I wanna congratulate all of you. Um, let's jump right into the uh, discussion. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'll, maybe what we can do is uh, have um, each, each student or student group uh, answer the question in the same order that they, they did their presentation, uh, if that works. So the first question is, um, why is SDG storytelling important to you? And why did you choose the topic that you presented today? Okay, uh, yeah, since I presented first, I'll go first. Um, yeah, this is Chen, uh, Chen Yang Oh, by the way. So for me, uh, I chose Mushroom Cafe because, you know, like the topic made sense to me. Um, I'm Korean and then, you know, Koreans like me, they love their coffee. But uh, I mean, like, like right now is that love, like, that love is not going anywhere. So what we need to do is like ensure uh, that the interest and excitement um, of coffee drinking is sustainable and that doesn't distract Korea from supporting the uh, uh, supporting and achieving the SDGs that I set out to like you know uh, achieve. So yeah, that was my topic, and then I thought it was like you know a new um what is it unexplored topic that uh, not a lot of people like you know talked about. So I thought it'd be interesting. Okay, um, I'll go second. Um, for me, I think SDG storytelling is very important because we can put a lot of data and information into interactive maps. And we can also educate ourselves and others to become more aware of our world and our surroundings. I chose my topic, rainwater harvesting, because of the thought that one day maybe we can reach day zero and that's a really scary thought. Um, that's the day in which everything that I've worked for, everything that I own, everything I have, none of it would really matter because I wouldn't have water and my survival is at risk. So that's what prompted me to work on this. Um, I would like to go ahead and answer for my team and Harvick, you can go second. Um, uh, so I would like to start by saying that sustainable fashion was a topic that really fascinated me. And I feel that everybody, everybody buy clothes and, you know, we all are fascinated by the idea of shopping and clothing and people also take it as a stress fast up. But uh, what people don't realize is that how our clothes are made and what is the process that lies behind everything all the all the produce that we get what is the process behind it so uh, that's one thing i would have wanted to portray from our presentation and um, i think you can carry on yeah and also the fact that where we live in india there's this tradition that uh, like if our siblings wear some clothes they often pass it on to their younger siblings and we continue to wear those clothes but that's whole 
tradition of you know upcycling clothes or change, let's say changing a dress into a new bag because it it is not of any use anymore was getting corrupted by the whole idea of fast fashion and these uh, brands like H and M, Zara coming up and the whole urbanization that's happening around and there this whole tradition was just getting lost and we just thought that there has to be some kind of a uh, bell that has to be some kind of uh, a call that has to be made that uh these if we see if the at the end of it the production that is happening is a result of the demand that we are creating so we there has to be a change in the attitude of the people if we want to change at a large level and that's why we decided to start with this app and start with this whole idea and spreading the message uh, i'd like to add on to as we as uh, they both said it's pretty much clear how fashion has become an entire concept of self-statement. And the app, our app's name, as you must have heard, is Fashion Shears, which basically portrays that we need to be conscious while choosing our own fashion, right? So over the summer break, while the shopping at sale prices were increasing, we just realized that there was a lot of consumerism in this industry, which again led to an excessive production and which proportionally adds tests to the environment resources too. So it's just about how we as good responsible citizens in co incorporating the SDGs in our life and, you know, pro pro move, move towards a sustainable future. Um, yes, I guess child labor is not one of the SDG goals, but I think that it's something we should really work upon because um, children, because children are really the future. So, like if most of them are working at ebay sites or you know quarry sites and just like like kind of wasting their entire childhood like just imagine what our future would be and like i got this idea because every day it's it's a it's a really common sight to see lots of children uh working under the heat um insights and every day when i go to school i see these children working and living under bridges and they're like in a distant dream like there's such a gap between me and them like they don't have any education they don't have any rights and i really think that we should you know work upon this because children are our future because they make up what will what what we will be in the coming years so yeah that's why i chose this topic thank you so much uh for for sharing uh, those responses and um those uh, informative comments uh, let's move on to the second question, um, and let's uh, we can keep the same order um, if if that's easier. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from the Eco Ambassadors program this summer? Okay, so my biggest takeaway was that you know we often think about uh, data as just numbers, but then like with story maps um, uh, through this project, um, uh, I'm able to like tell uh, you know connect them and really show the magnitude of the issues like we're describing and then like we're facing today and the solution uh becomes more apparent because like you know uh we can actually see the numbers and visualize it rather than just you know stating it out and then like you know uh i can tell people uh ways people can contribute not just like uh state out the problem and then do nothing about it <laughs> um okay so SDG showed me um, tools and processes that can make my presentation and my idea look very engaging to many people with different kinds of knowledge and um, different backgrounds. If it looks appealing, it can get people's attention and also spur them into action. And it's, it becomes a very um, easy to understand message. Before the story map, I had done the work of, you know, building the whole rainwater harvesting system with the solar panel and everything. But until I started making the story map with NASA's data and also global context, um, I realized that my story could become like very compelling. And I was also able to understand the real severity of the problem. 
uh, right so i'd like to add on so in the end it's always about change right so when this entire talk this entire project came in front of us. We were like, it was literally like an opportunity that was knocking our door. And when we're working towards a better cause, why not just take it? And I mean, we have seen many activists like Greta Thunberg, and we just sometimes are on a way to support them. But sometimes we also like to imagine ourselves in a place where people will be supporting us, people will be campaigning us and championing us, right? So that's there's a sense of authority, and while you try to how do I explain it? Well, you try to be an activist in yourself, an eco ambassador as yourself. So this platform basically provided us a sense of responsibility that in the end of the day, yes, the problems do exist in the earth. We can, yes, you know, blame the government, blame the societies. But in the end, it's upon us whether to take the responsibility or not. And the whole process of making storyboards, I think, was a very effective one because when you know we organized all our ideas, all our data into this into a storyboard, it really gave some reality checks in the you know with with what how much waste are we producing or how how harmful our choices or the, our desires are for the society. And yeah, it was some kind of a reality check. And also, I was always fascinated by the idea of sustainability, but when it comes to being creative in uh, to you know to spread the idea of sustainability it, it fascinates me even more so through the storyboard through the various features it had it, it pushed us to become creative and imaginative as to how we spread the message i would like to agree with my teammates and add a little something of my of myself um i would also like to say that uh, the storyboard really gave us a platform to you know put our data effectively like we had so much data to present about you know surveys and uh, etc and so i think that the storyboard feature was a really good one to kind of express our thoughts and data etc so I think through this project, we got to research and think more about everyday actions we do, everything, things we do, like shopping, buying things. And specifically me, I think I got to know that through even buying a single pair of jeans, what goes on, how it's made, and this will definitely make me think twice before I buy something else and will leave a long lasting effect. Um, so, like I had mentioned before, um, my biggest takeaway from this Eco Ambassador program is that, you know, the world is full of diversity and it's so much diversity that, you know, you can't really experience it in one life. There's so much diversity. and whatever issue we are facing right now like there are so many issues um there is climate change there is global warming there is pollution there is plastic waste um even more so um what i believe is that if we believe in our surroundings if we believe in all those traditions traditions which our ancestors have been following traditions which um our friends our relatives even strangers they have been following for generations for centuries if we are aware of these um different cultures as well as different practices and if we really like embed those into our daily life like we will overcome any challenge we ever face and we need to understand that we are all connected like we are in this huge web of life and we are connected with strangers we see every day we are connected with the plants growing in our backyard plants growing um anywhere in the world even though you're staying somewhere you're connected with everyone you're connected with this universe because you're a part of it and if you want to solve an issue, like you need to understand the world as a whole. Like you will not be able to solve any issue if you separate yourself from nature because nature was what made you. 
like you are part of nature. So I think that that is my biggest takeaway from the Eco Ambassador program. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts uh, and, and experience uh, over the summer. Um, that uh, concludes the discussion uh, segment of uh, this, uh, this event. Um, so maybe I'll just conclude by, by saying that you all continue to inspire us. Uh, I, uh, Radhika, I think we need uh, more of these events and sessions uh, to learn, to, to continue to learn uh, from, from students and eco ambassadors, not just over the summer, but, but throughout the year uh, as well. So thank you again for all your wonderful presentations. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot to learn from you. So me and my team use story maps uh, in, in uh, different contexts. So sometimes it's to support countries uh, to report on, on their SDG progress. Sometimes it's uh, to support researchers to contextualize the data that they've produced for the SDGs. Um, and I think uh, we, we all uh, admire the way uh, all of you have been utilizing the story map uh, tool uh, for your work and we'll continue to learn from you. So thank you again. And I will hand it over back um, to, uh, I am not sure who the next uh, presenter is, uh, but I do have to apologize that I have to uh, leave and join another event. So I won't be able to stay on, but I'll make sure to watch the recording. Uh, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much Mariam and thank you so much to our student presenters. Um, I think this is a perfect way to also lead into our next panelists, uh, Alan Carroll and Michelle Thomas. We hope you really enjoyed the students presentation, um, seeing how the platforms that you have you have founded and that you work on, how the students are using it. So at this point we I would love to hand it over to you. If you can just briefly introduce yourself to the group and um, just uh, share your thoughts and how the story map, the, the platform was founded, the idea behind it, how you can create a story map. Please, um, please go ahead. Great, thank you so much. This has so, been so in inspiring. It's, uh, you know, the, the first thing I wanna talk about is, is why story maps, and we've already seen why story maps. Uh, just, it's, it's such a thrill to us to see uh, your stories and to, uh, to, to to the the notion that our our little tool is being put to such good use to uh, to make people aware of uh, of important issues and solutions is is really wonderful. Um, so so in a way, I don't really need to talk about why story maps, but uh, but let me give just a, a couple of words about my background and and why we came up with story maps. So. Um, I, my name is Alan Carroll. I founded the Story Maps effort at at Esri, the the big GIS company, um, and I've worked at Esri for about 12 years. And before that, I was at National Geographic for 27 years. Uh, the last few years, I was the chief cartographer, so, sort of the head map maker. And at that, at that point, I was thinking that you know I've, I've always always felt that maps tell stories, very vivid and exciting and important stories but they can tell them even better if they're kind of brought to life on the internet and combined with other multimedia content. So I did some early experimenting at National Geographic with that, but it's after I came to Esri in late 2010 that I was really able to start to uh, you know, form a team and start to build our own stories and sort of figure out uh, how story maps might work. Um, and we didn't really have all the goals and uses in mind as we built story maps, but but now I, I like to think of story maps as providing a kind of two-way street. So one is a route outward. And by that, I mean that GIS professionals, ge geographic information systems people, geospatial specialists uh, are often producing amazing data, but often in the past, that data has been kind of hidden and hard to find or impossible to find by the general public. So story maps, we hoped, and it's turned out this way, have provided a nice way for those geospatial professionals to share their stories within their organizations, but also to much broader audiences, people people like you, um, and make this really important and useful and interesting and insightful data available to, to more and more people. And then the other direction is to provide 
a, a, a kind of a route inward or a gateway to the world of GIS for people like you. So people, young people, people who might not have had any exposure to geographic information systems or might understand only the basics of geography. So story maps have become a way to uh, for people to kind of learn and, and sort of open their eyes to the wonders of our world via ge geography and geographic information systems. So that's kind of are, are thinking about story maps. In addition, of course, story maps have been uh, have proven really, really useful uh, in the classroom. So teachers are assigning story maps to their students. Organizations like SDSN are challenging students to create their own stories, and that's that's really thrilling to us. And it, it's helped again a lot of young open open young minds and young people to uh, to the power of storytelling in general but also the the geography and and place-based storytelling in particular um i'm going to share my screen for a little bit here and just go over a few uh few thoughts about uh about storytelling and i i almost hesitate to bring this up because you're already really effective storytellers uh, but these are some things that as we've created our own stories, and I've created dozens, probably hundreds, these are some of the things I've learned that might be useful as, to you as you create and think about story, uh, creating your own story maps. So I could come up probably with 90 or 900 uh, tips, but here, here are nine that I hope is going to be, I hope are going to be useful. So I used to say you could put together a story map in 20 minutes, but as you know, it takes a lot more time to put together a good story map. So um, uh, our when we create a story map, we, we make lots of changes and edits and sometimes we'll discard an idea and go back to the beginning. So it's a creative process and that means that it really kind of has to be messy. But at any rate, one thing we like to do is start with a bang. And so what I mean by that is to come up with a, a cover image and a title and subtitle that really kind of grab people. And usually that means not just having a label like plastic pollution, but coming up with some something that's a, a title that kind of draws people into the story. And also um, ideally a, a title and an image that kind of work together. So we did a story map uh, called Hot Numbers about some of the key facts and figures for climate change and thought that hot numbers was a was a kind of fun play on words and worked well with an introductory graphic. Uh, second is to add a hero. Uh, and by the way, not all of these tips apply to every story map by any means. So there are lots of good story maps that don't have a hero, but but it is a good thing to think about and consider. So people love learning about people and story maps can be kind of dry and impersonal if they don't involve people. So we, we, we love to try to profile actual human individuals in various ways. So we worked with a National Geographic Explorer, for instance, called Paul Selopek, and he's literally walking across the world. And so the story maps we've done with him uh, take his perspective perspective and and we have pictures of you know videos of him walking through landscapes and things and i threw this little clownfish in because uh just to make the point that uh that heroes don't necessarily have to be people so there have been wonderful stories about say migratory birds or reefs or something that might focus on an individual animal especially now that there's all this wonderful tracking data and stuff uh, third is to give your story rhythm again this doesn't apply to every story but a lot of times a story will have repeated elements and that can turn into a kind of pattern that's that people become familiar with as they read a story. So this is a story about dams in the American West and it starts with a big picture and a simple graphic and goes on to a more detailed text and a, and a series of images. And it repeats that pattern through the story. And I think that makes it again, more accessible and more comfortable to people to uh, to read it. Uh, and the fourth point is to create a little world. And what I mean by that is that that you can try to style your story, uh, even in terms of the writing style, but especially in terms of graphics and images, so that so that things don't just look like a random collection, but they kind of fit together. So this is a story about a, uh, a, a fish, a couple of sp species of fish. And as you can see, it's all the photos are all black and white. The maps are really simple, just black 
white, gray, and bright red. And it uses that theme throughout the story. And, and the result is something that, that really kind of draws you in and keeps you in. And it, as, as I say, it's like its own little world. Next is one size doesn't fit all. Uh, and as you know, story maps work just as well on tablets and mobile devices as they do on big screens. And so as you're authoring a story, you're usually authoring it on a big screen, but it's important to preview your story at different screen sizes because that can change the look and feel of your story. Uh, our teams have worked really hard to make sure story maps are equally beautiful, no matter what the screen size is. But as an author, it's important to kind of check those different screen sizes and make sure your story is working well in all those different formats. Um, speaking of sizes, uh, there's another way I, I, I think about size. Uh, by thinking big and thinking small. And this is in terms of the approach of your story. So often, of course, maps might show a whole country or a whole world, but then you might wanna drill down onto a specific place or a human being. And that, that, that difference, that rhythm between um, small scale, you know, looking at a broad area, usually with maps, but not always, sometimes with imagery and aerial photography, but then zooming in it's for things that might be examples of the larger issue that you're showing. And you can either start zoomed in and zoom back, zoom out to, to an overview, or you can do it the other way that both, both stories, both methods can be really um, effective. Next is to think about using active and passive maps. So we love interactive maps and I tend to sort of assume that every map has to be interactive, but, but a lot of times just making a screen grab of a map and putting it in as an image can be really effective. So that means that you can show people exactly what you want them to, to see and understand without necessarily distracting them by making them pan and zoom and click around uh, within a map. We also use what we call map choreography, which is what you're seeing in this little animation. So as users scroll, the maps might change in terms of their zoom level or where they're, where they're pointing to or the the, inform, the information layer on the map so that, so that the user doesn't really have to interact, but it's almost as if the story itself is providing that interaction. Uh, another one is to keep it short and sweet. So we all get really, uh, we all fall in love with our topics, but, but of course, often people uh, aren't willing to stick around to read a lot, uh, lots and lots and lots of text. So we work really hard to make our stories uh, really short. A colleague of mine named Ross Donahue did a wonderful story about this uh, insect, which in, in the Eastern United States comes out every 17 years. Yeah. And, he, and he did a nice short, quick story about okay. it that's, that's, that, that we think is effective partly because it's so short. And then finally, is to, to make a call to action. So what I mean by that is if you're, you, you want your story to inspire people and your stories certainly do, but if you've gotten your readers inspired, you want to give them some means to take action. So that might be a link to an organization that they can volunteer for, or it might be a, 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 or a nonprofit that they can donate to, or even just more, uh, you know, more things to read about a certain topic. But it's nice to uh, to turn that excitement about a topic that you've you've created that excitement. So you now want to point your readers to something to do to to take action with that excitement. So that's uh, that's kind of the uh, my my quick uh, story about story maps, and I, I hope it's been helpful. But again you're already really effective storytellers and it's been so exciting to see the wonderful work that you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you so much for creating this and making it so available to the students. And now we see how a uh, platform that you have founded, how it's really impacting and affecting students. And we're really looking forward to, you know, so much more that it can do and really hearing from you with what it was intended to do, its original design, as well as these very extremely practical tips. I think really we can take it now to even more students and bring more um, into the Eco and Master program and beyond to, to use it in the ways that you have seen it used. So thank Great. You. Uh, one, one more thing really quick. I wanted to point you to a collection that my friend and colleague, uh, Michelle Thomas has created. Uh, she can add the URL in the window, but this is a nice collection of stories 
uh, that provide some instructions. Uh, you'll, you can see my uh, nine steps to great storytelling there. And there, there there's a bunch of other um, useful uh, tips and stories and things that you can you can look at. So for, sorry for almost forgetting that. No, no, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michelle. So since we are on the topic of the storytelling, um, we're going to continue in that discussion and see how um, the storytelling has been used, used, has been told using different medium as well, including the arts as an educational tool. So I would like to invite uh, my colleague, Jasmine Mora from the Center for Sustainable Development um, Education Program Coordinator to take on the next segment. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jasmine. We're like Kane was saying, we're gonna start the art of storytelling. For this, I would like to introduce Anne Nielsen from Turning Around Cards. I know that she has her team with her, Liz Lizzie and Saya, that will be doing the presentation. So if you could all introduce yourself briefly, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Great to see everyone. Amazing, amazing work that the youth presented this morning. Thank you so much, um, Adana. I'm going to tweet out your open call to all of our contacts. You, what a great message. I'd like to introduce my colleagues, um, Sayarchana and Lizzie, who are going to present on the Turn It Around Cards movement, um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to them. Definitely. First of all, I just wanted to say I'm so inspired by all of you. Um, thank you for all the powerful work that you do. Um, I loved your presentations. It was amazing. Um, my name is Sayarshana Dura. I'm the youth engagement lead for Turn It Around Cards. I worked on the social media side, the partnership side, and the social media side. And I'll hand it off to Lizzie to briefly introduce herself to before moving on to the presentation. Good morning, all, and again, thank you for all you do. I'm Lizzie Quigley, and I'm a student at Arizona State University, and I'm a youth education ambassador for Turnaround Cards, as well as a partner through the Sustainability Teachers Academy, and I focus on the curriculum and activity development side with the cards. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to share, um, could someone share their screen by any chance? The, we added our PowerPoint presentation to the, um, okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, Turned Around Cards is a global movement um, made by young people throughout the world to basically bridge the gap between policymakers and young people. Oftentimes, policymakers and decision makers around education make decisions about the future of the world without the people who will be living those futures. And we think that that is a grave injustice and that young people deserve to have a voice in these decision-making processes. Um, we wanted to turn it around. Basically, oftentimes, older people make um, curriculum decisions and policy decisions about the world um, without engaging young minds. And we wanted young minds to basically inform um, older policymakers and educators about what visions that these young people have. And we wanted to create, take a creative way to illustrate these ideas. We wanted to do it through storytelling. Um, so we had young people throughout the world create artwork and writing about what changes they envision in environmental education and environmental policy. Um, so in about one month, we got 430 submissions from around 44 countries and five continents around the world, from young people even as young as six years old, to illustrate what visions they have around climate change. Oftentimes, when you think about um, who is invited into climate change decision-making rooms, we think about um, people who are um, politicians who have been working in the field for um, decades, or um, people who have, who have been at climate marches. But we wanted to basically highlight the voices of young people that haven't really been heard, and that that is how this project was born. So we created a card deck um, of artwork and writing from young people throughout the world. Um, each card has an artwork on one side and a piece of writing on the other side. And that piece of writing either is a written form of reflection or a call to action from a policymaker. Um, I have a card here as an example. One side has a piece of artwork, the other side has a piece of writing. And we've been traveling the world, sharing these card decks with world leaders, um, including we were in Scotland for the United Nations COP26 conference. We were um, in Paris for the UNESCO Transforming Education Pre-Summit. Um, we were just in New York um, this past weekend for the Transforming Education Summit to basically mm -hmm. share these visions of young people with these educational and climate change policymakers in order to make sure that young people were informing the policies that were um, creating their, future, their futures. Um, next slide. 
We also created a policy report. Um, so we had an amazing team of PhD students analyze all the pieces of artwork and writing that these young people sent to us. And we created a policy report with policy suggestions for climate education decision makers and policy makers. Um, so this policy report is a very unique report. Um, it takes a very abstract um, approach towards policy making suggestions. We had um, a lot of artwork analyzation, we had poetry in it, and our whole goal was to basically um, bring the arts and um, creativity into policy making spaces. Oftentimes when we think about climate change, um, people tend to think that the only people who will solve it are the scientists and the policymakers, um, but we wanted to bring in the artists, the writers, and the creatives into this movement because this movement truly needs every single person, including the young people. And this whole movement is working to basically make sure that young people's ideas are heard through um, these measures. So um, we basically shared the policy report and the cards with um, UN officials, including the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Um, we shared it with the UN Climate Envoy um, for the US. Um, we also shared it with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Executive Secretary Patricia Espinosa. And our goal is to basically make sure that these visions are handed into um, the hands of world leaders that are making these decisions about climate change. Um, so yeah, next slide. I'm going to pass it on to Lizzie. Yes, so as you've heard from Sarjana, this is really supposed to turn it around how we think about education, especially in regards to climate education. Usually we have leadership making decisions for youth, and now it's time to turn it around and have youth make the decisions for leaders. So that is really the goal of this initiative, is to rethink and reimagine how we view education, how we view policy making, and who we're involving at the table when making decisions regarding climate. And next slide, please. Yeah, so one of the goals that we'll go into, and I'll let Sarishna come back and talk about this, is focusing on the ways you can turn it around um, through different intergenerational decolonial method logical and pedagogical turns. And if you can go to the next slide, I'll pass it back to Sayarchana. So we had an amazing team of PhD students from Arizona State University analyze all the pieces of artwork and writing um, to come up with basically turns for policymakers and um, educational decision makers around climate change. The first turn is an intergenerational turn. Um, our goal is to basically turn around um, how um, policymakers make decisions because oftentimes they're making decisions without including young people in the rooms. And we wanted to make sure that children and youth were informing policymakers about the decisions around their future. Next slide. Next turn is a decolonial turn, which I think is incredibly important. In the climate movement, we cannot truly have a movement if there's not a social justice component of it. And this part of the turn um, in the Turnaround Cards movement basically um, works to cut across the established hierarchies of Western knowledge and make sure that multiple perspectives, including indigenous perspectives and land-based knowledges um, and non-Western philosophies are heard and seen and valued by policymakers because oftentimes um, they have been prioritizing Western philosophies. And we want to make sure that different cultures and people from all Corners of the world are heard. Next slide. The other turn is a methodological turn. Um, oftentimes when we think about policy making, we think about words on a piece of paper and we think about professional speeches given and um, very professional settings. But we wanted to basically take a creative approach towards policy making spaces by adding um, this turn for creativity. We wanted to see how can we include more artwork and creativity and poetry and writing in these spaces that have been traditionally very um, strict and um, very formal. We wanted to make sure that we take a very um, creative and also inclusive approach towards these um, spaces to make sure that um, all the ecological, experiential, and empirical knowledges that are present in these spaces also take um, 
the mode of imagination and poetry and artwork in considering how can we transform um, these spaces? Because in order to transform um, the world, we need creativity. We need to radically imagine, reimagine how we approach humanity systems. And in order to radically imagine, reimagine how we approach these systems, we need creativity. So our goal is to call for these world leaders to take more creative approaches and welcome in more creative approaches towards transforming this world. Next slide. And finally, the last turn is the pedagogical turn. Um, this is incredibly important because we need to inspire and mobilize the future um, healers of this world. We want to advocate for more comprehensive climate education because oftentimes a lot of curriculums around the world deeply neglect climate education. And we think that we are doing our future generations a deep disgrace by not preparing them for the future of this climate crisis. Um, during the next decade, in the decades to come, there's going to be a lot of disasters around climate change, unfortunately, if we don't turn it around. And we want to prepare these young minds to address these intense global challenges. And if we don't prepare them, we're doing our future generations a deep disgrace. We want different um, universities, schools, and organizations throughout the world to educate their youth about climate change. But we don't want to just end at young people. We want to make sure that education is a lifelong journey and educate people from all different ages across the world and how to address this climate crisis. We don't only want to educate them about the problem, but also on how they can solve it, which is why this project has also been amazing in giving young people a way to kind of like translate their knowledge into something physical and tangible to create shifts around them in this climate movement. Next slide. So um, we have been working to continue this project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the university partnerships we've been working on. Um, so right now we are working with the Asian University Network, um, which is a collection of amazing universities in Southeast Asia in creating a new card deck. So the goal of this new card deck is to basically highlight the ideas and the visions and the hopes and the dreams of young people in Southeast Asian countries, because those people in that specific region go through very unique environmental challenges that other areas of the world don't. And our goal is to highlight their unique experiences through a new card deck. Um, so we have been working to create a new card deck for this. Um, and um, the deadline for submissions is um, on October 31st. So if you know any young person from Southeast Asia, feel free to send them our website link that Anne left in the chat box, which has more information on how to um, submit um, artwork and writing um, to basically be featured in this card deck. And we are potentially working on also partnering with some MENA universities. Um, we're still in the gist of doing that. Um, and we are hoping to basically um, engage youth from the MENA region and the US region in a cross-cultural collaboration and um, basically have them collaborate with one another to develop climate solutions and also learn about how to become effective young leaders in this climate crisis. Um, so we are still in the gist of planning that. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Lizzie to talk about the rest of the future of this project. Yeah, so the future of this project is still like thinking about where do we go from here? We have this card deck, we're developing more. What do we use this for? As you've heard before, we've been reaching out to policymakers. They're receiving this content with the policy reports and the cards, but it's time to bring it back to the youth, bring it back into the classroom, which is why we are expanding our partnerships into universities and developing programs with them focused on activity development, as well as into educators. We are currently running a fellowship with teachers from the US and India to develop activities or lesson plans using the turn around cards to educate their students about climate and sustainability education. And we are additionally working on different programs, such as a program with ASU students to develop activities using the turn around cards and expanding this network to really focus on how do we use these cards differently? How do we get creative? How do we reach their full potential? And that is why we're expanding our resources into not just these card decks, but having curriculum tied to the card decks as well as other resources, having activities so people can play games using them and really just have fun while learning about climate. We go to the next slide. So how do you get involved? Um, all of you here are members of this planet, which means you are involved in the climate and sustainability efforts. So we would love for you to get involved with our project and you can visit our website, 
to learn more about the project, as well as if you're interested in submitting your own submissions or sharing that with someone else, you can get connected with us through our social media, which is on this slide or contact through email. And we would love to see you there. We would love to see you create your own activity. We'd love to see you use the cards in your own classrooms with your friends, with your family, and just really share this vision of when tackling sustainability issues, when tackling climate change, there's a lot of weight, a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. So have fun with it where you can. And I think that's all we have. So thank you. Thank you so much to you both. That was an amazing presentation. Um, just in, uh, in the interest of time, if you have any questions, please type them up in the chat. And I think we're gonna wait until the end for like questions for all our panelists. I want to introduce our next panelist, Janabi uh, Bat. He, she she's here with us. If 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 she can introduce herself briefly and and start her presentation. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Janavi Janavi Bhatt. Uh, I'm a language arts teacher. I teach creative writing, and I'm also an eco enthusiast, like most of you out here. I've been associated with the Eco Ambassador Program uh, for the last uh, four years as a mentor. But I think I've learned a lot more than I have contributed. It's inspired me to get involved in uh, environmental initiatives in my local community. Uh, first and foremost, let me tell you how impressed I am with the kids, the story maps that they have come up with. They're just fantastic. You know, they're so passionate, articulate, and they have uh, created such uh, amazing presentations that incorporate both content, creativity, and data research. And it's, it's a very, very, their projects are very effective. Um, also, I'd like to compliment uh, uh, platforms like uh, the story map by Esri and turn it around cards, because a huge component of creative writing is, uh, you know, um, visual and sensory elements, how to incorporate. And when you have platforms like these, you know, where you can incorporate arts, crafts, images, visuals, and data and in an interactive manner, it is a lot more effective and a lot more accessible to people across um, you know, different ages and countries and cultures. So, you know, it's a great platform uh, for kids to present. Now, um, you know, not that anybody out here needs it, but I'm going to talk about a few uh, essential tips for creative writing and what we generally understand by creative writing. Now, like, um, you know, creative writing is a great way of discovering things about yourself and about your world and the world around you and expressing this understanding in an effective manner that inspires others and influences them to take uh, some kind of action. Now, what you say and how you say it, you know, is very important because you are uh, using this, the skill that you have to inspire people to action, to do something constructive. And what do you need for that? You need imagination, and you need great ideas. Now, one thing I tell my students to, if you want to hone your imagination, work on it, is to read and to read a lot, you know, read lots of books across different genres, novels, short stories, science fiction, newspapers, magazines, brochures. And this is a great way to build your imagination. And very often people ask me, so how do you get the idea? Well, you know, ideas are all around you. They are in simple everyday things like these students have shown us, right? They are in the places you visit, the people you meet, the encounters you have, like, like seeing a child labor on your, a laborer on your way to school. It's all around you, but you need to be open to that. You know, you, you need to open up your mind to different encounters, experiences, and people. And most importantly, from what I've heard today, the students say the ideas, the biggest and the most effective ideas are found in um, the gaps between diverse opinions, you know, diverse cultures, diverse um, issues and concepts. And when we try and bridge these gaps, when we try and make connections between the gaps is when we hit upon that big idea, you know, for that you want to take to the world. So um, one great way of, uh, you know, honing your writing skills and all is to, to note down, like to journal writing or, or keeping a diary. 
you know, write down your innermost thoughts. It helps you get in touch with what you feel strongly about. What are your fears, hopes, insecurities? And uh, writing them down, you know, penning them down at the end of the day helps you process them, helps you organize it in a safe space where you're not judged by anyone, you know. So this is a great way to develop your voice, your style of writing. And um, another thing is, as, uh, you know, uh, Alan said from uh, uh, in his presentation, is to keep things simple. So I, I have a principle that I always emphasize to my students is like kiss and tell. So always tell a great story and always keep it simple. You don't need you know, a flashy presentation, you don't need too much happening, you don't need high, you know, like big words that require people to look up dictionary, you need to keep things simple, for instance, like take a book like Animal Farm, or, you know, The Little Prince, they are so simple, and you can read them at every stage of your life, and they may mean different things to different people. So you, you need to keep everything simple and tell a great story. Another thing, thing is um, figuring out like why were all these presentations so effective that the kids presented because they knew like they have figured out that what do I want to tell and why do I want to tell it and what do I hope to accomplish again as you know in the last presentation they spoke about the call to action so not creativity for creativity's sake but creativity in order to inspire a movement, an action in people. For that, what you need to know is you need to know your audience. Like, who are you addressing? Who is it that you want to engage? And what is it that you want from them? You know, so there is a glut of information. We live in an information age. There is so much content out there. So how do you make yours stand out? So you need creativity for that. You need to be creative. You need platforms like these to you know, make your message more accessible and um, you know, that platforms that utilize these sensory and visual elements that makes it more interesting. And um, creativity and content. So they all may, always must go together. You know, one without the other is, is meaningless. You know, creativity must always defer to content. So understand that you need at the end of the day, you need to grab your audience's attention and you need to get them to think. Because when, when your audience starts thinking about what you have said, about your message, you know, it's going to go down into uh, their memory. Memory is, is essentially a residue of thought. You know, it, this is what gets like what we mean by metacognition. Like, how do you make it relevant? When you feel passionate about something, when it's relevant to you and that passion shines through, through a platform like, say, Turn It Around or, you know, um, um, Esri, that's when you are going to get people to remember what you've said and then act upon it. So, you know, these are like just a few tips that I have today. Like, you know, be yourself, read you know, write a little every day. It'll help you find your style. It'll help you find a voice. And most important, as I see from what's happening today, it'll help you find your cause, you know, because that that cause and that passion that you bring to your cause is what is going to inspire action. So that's all I have to say today. This has been amazing. And I'm really, uh, you know, honored to be a part of this uh, whole program. I've it's been great interacting with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryanger and Jasmine. Thank, Thank you so Jan. much, Janavi. Um, for our next segment, we have curriculum development, and we're going to start with Betsy Freeman and her students. Betsy, if you can please introduce yourself and your students. Hi, yes. First, thank you so much for having us. We um, always love to join into this global community of um, learners and practitioners. So I'm uh, Betsy Freeman. I am a uh, middle school enrichment teacher. I am also the coordinator of green initiatives and sustainability for our district. I've um, asked uh, one of my students who is here with me, one of my former students who is here with me, uh, Christopher Sorrell. I'll let him introduce himself in a, um, in a second. But um, 
since our segment is on curricular development, you may think, oh my goodness, why would a student be speaking, um, you know, along with an educator? And of course, the student learning standards and objectives are all about the, um, the people that we hope and aim for our students to become. And so um, Chris is uh, one of the students, I think, who embodies um, the kind of thoughtful um, global citizen who will be able to, you know, contribute to good society. And I think a lot of that um, stems from how he has um, viewed and taken the, his SDG knowledge and action, you know, into his his own life. So, um, Chris, with that, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a junior in high school. Um, I'm attending a boarding school in New Hampshire called Phillips Exeter. Um, a little bit about myself. Yeah, I was a Miss Freeman student, um, I think like four or five years ago, but uh, the things I learned with her have still sticked with me to this day. Um, and I think mostly to me, you know, the SDGs is just like a mindset and a way of, you know, perceiving the world. And, um, you know, I think it informs, you know, our, our decisions and, you know, it should be part of educating, you know, future global citizens of the world. So. I can um, just jump in here. I know one of the things that you really wanted to um, explore with us today is, um, you know, how uh, did we begin to um, integrate the SDGs in our curriculum and ha how has that process evolved? So we developed our enrichment program about um, five years ago with the SDGs as in integrating theme and it started in uh, through a GT program and then school-wide enrichment. And uh, both those programs are designed to help students become um, autonomous, uh, lifelong learner, excuse me, learners, where, you know, they link inquiry, knowledge and um, action in real world problem solving settings, right? So that seems exactly like the formula for education for sustainable development, right? Where we're empowering and motivating kids, you know, to become these active citizens, you know, who um, are critical thinkers and, you know, can shape and make their mark and contribution to a sustainable world. So um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about what that looks in practice, I think in the classroom setting first and in our school-wide program, since we've had a number of years of experience with that now. And then I'll share what that looks like as we, you know, roll that out to the um, to the district at large. So in practice, the um, uh, philosophy that we use is, you know, it's a learner-centered approach. It's action-oriented learning, and it's also transformative learning. So, you know, it's all about the student uh, making meaning, looking for um, issues and problems that they may um, see and identify in their local community, bridging that to global community, and having that catalyzed learning where students um, co-construct knowledge together, right? So, in all of these, they're um, they're team based. In the GT program, it of course also links to the um, uh, New Jersey uh, learning standards, and then also to the uh, National Association for Gifted Children uh, learning standards. Which um, I think, oftentimes, when you say standards out in public, people freeze up like, "Oh my God!" You know, they're these you know rigid kind of lanes that, um, uh, you know, may constrain creativity for teachers. And I, I think it's the opposite. They become um, springboards for learning. So we like to say that we use the SDGs as a, um, like our sandbox for problem solving. So um, just as, as an example, I usually start the year with, um, 
you know, teaching kids how to take, uh, you know, Cornell notes to put us on good grounding for the rest of the year. And how we do that, of course, we incorporate that with um, uh, learning about the SDGs. And then we go on to, um, you know, other thinking skills that support all of those um, teacher student practices that enable um, active learning and transformative learning. So the key to that is really all about um, partnerships and real world projects. So we, I also introduced systems thinking um, at the beginning of the year, and we use that year after year after year after year, evolving our um, uh, ways that we uh, think and, and act um, as systems thinkers and, and making change. So a big part of system thinking is um, understanding interdependencies, multiple perspectives, and looking for leverage points. So when we think about um, how the SDGs work in schools and you know successfully, it's really all about partnerships. And those partnerships are gonna be with the, um, of course, the curriculum leaders in your school, with students, with community leaders, um, with, uh, nonprofit groups out in the community, certainly with um, groups, uh, you know, like the very one that we're in right now that are, you know, a, a range of, you know, academia, you know, to experts, to mentors, to, um, to role models. And so the big piece of that is ensuring that you have those partners to guide and support um, all along the way. So it works incredibly well for us now. How will that look like? What will that look like? And how can that work in, uh, you know, diverse classrooms through where our, we are at K-8 to district? So we um, adopted this fantastic mission statement two years ago that's all about empowering members of the community to lead uh, lives with integrity cultivate a spirit of discovery and embrace connections in diverse global society which is pretty much the sdgs in um a nutshell so the the culture of our school which is one that continues to evolve already supports that um the integration of SDGs as a pathway to that very goal of embracing connections in the diverse global society and leading a, a life with, you know, integrity and discovery. So if we um, maybe step back, we have that culture in our district. One of the partnerships that helps us to um, strengthen and fuel that culture. We also um, participate in the Sustainable Jersey for Schools program, being a New Jersey school. There's, I think, a thousand or so schools that are um, connected to that program. And we're currently one of three districts in the states where all of our schools are, um, you know, have that top certification, silver, which is like, great. Yay, which means there's a whole lot of people working to develop a sustainable school. At the base of that is this idea, and you know, I think it's, you know, all across education, all across business, what gets measured matters. And so in this case, we already have a, um, a context where um, we have measurable goals towards sustainability. And at the um, district level, those goals are in place, and then in each one of the school levels, which goes a long way towards um, supporting introduction of SDGs. So this past summer, what we started to do was um, we have uh, three strategic planning committees of which I'm on uh, one of them. We have an inquiry committee, we have a, um, a social emotional learning committee, and then we have a partnership committee. All three of those committees, of course, would support, um, you know, students becoming uh, 
global citizens and you know active contributors to to good society so um what we did was take all of the learning stand excuse me all of the curriculum across the district and we're mapping sustainability um lessons and activities uh, to each one of the student learning standards and integrating them into the curriculum. Um, from there, as the green coordinator, I'm also mapping um, SDGs to each one of those. From there, we're also curating all of our partnerships across the district. So we have all of those, um, you know, uh, mentors, community resources, experts that will be available to, um, you know, to uh, all in the district. So while of course that all looks great on paper when you're doing it, I think of course, when you um, roll it out to um, all of the teachers and administrators in school, that's where you hit the, um, you know, what real world school looks like. So um, I, I can tell you that some of the um, challenges that we're anticipating is, of course, I think schools all across the U.S. are looking at um, learning loss that has happened because of the pandemic, right? So now you have teachers and administrators who want to make sure that they get this um, critical like learning um, and support for students, you know, so that they can bring their skills uh, back up. And at the same time, we also have the um, shortage of teachers that, you know, coming out of the pandemic as well. So you also have um, uh, teachers who are, you know, a lot of them coming new uh, to the practice. So um, looking at both of those challenges, uh, one of the ways that we're uh, tackling it is, um, A, it's not a, um, you know, a one-year um, uh, rollout, it's a two-year rollout. And how we'll do that is through new teacher academies, because the flip side of, you know, oh, no, you know, we're losing a lot of experienced teachers, which is, of course, a, um, you know, a, uh, a, a drain for any district, um, is that now we have the opportunity to relook at what our um, onboarding process is on teachers and where we can fit um, sustainability and then the SDGs into that uh, learning process. We also have um, teacher academies throughout the year. So we'll use those opportunities as well as in service days. But again, I think, you know, of course, the big challenge is, uh, you know, as it is for everybody, just time, time and competing priorities. So I think that, um, you know, one of the tips that I might share for um, teachers and districts based on our experience is uh, all about partnerships. And I know that many on this panel are um, host to many of those partnerships and uh, you know invite um, educators in for uh, professional development. And certainly the Center for Sustainable Development is at you know at the fore with that, as in New Jersey, the you know Audubon Society, Sustainable Jersey, and a number of um, uh, educator uh, groups tied to sustainability. But I think it's this idea of keeping students at the fore. And then, you know, if I put my system stinker hat on, it's looking, you know, long term at that, you know, what do we want our students to look at? And how does, um, what does that, how do they how do we ensure that they're living what they learn? And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I invited Chris. Um, and I thought maybe he could like maybe share for um, some of what his experience is with what he did with the um, SDGs having been introduced to them five years ago. 
Thank you, Ms. Kleeman. Uh, with the interest of time, I just want to mention that we have 15 minutes left and uh, if we can all go uh, quickly because we have a couple of uh, um, speakers left. Thank you so much for your intervention. Yes. I think, Chris, if you just want to take a minute and share some of okay. what you're doing and then we'll um, uh, roll over to okay, the yeah, uh, next group. Um, so, yeah, so m most of my experiences with the SDGs have been just, you know, learning in the classroom, at least like originally that's how it starts, you know, uh, th that's the main impact of it. But, you know, over time, it really has influenced who I've become and it's empowered me as a learner to take action. And um, I think the way I've done so most recently is um, uh, as part or as part of my school's environmental group, um, we're doing uh, we're essentially developing our own curriculum, um, and it's it's all student led, and we're essentially uh, trying to create an interdisciplinary approach to uh, climate disruption and education surrounding the environment. Um, so what we're, what we're doing is to include uh, environmentalism in every single subject. And uh, I think uh, the SDGs have really informed that because uh, the entire purpose of it is not to be just like, oh, you should do this uh, so you become an environmentalist, but to uh, appeal to everyone and to appeal to all tenets of society. Um, yeah, um, I, I also have been working on another project um, and, and doing research under a doctor. And the reason I met uh, was because uh, of a climate summit. And I think like just opportunities like those are, are really invaluable and, and you know, partnerships, as Ms. Freeman mentioned, are incre incredibly invaluable to uh, success in this world. And I, I'm, I, as a conclusion, I just want to say thank you to Ms. Freeman and everyone here for coming. And uh, Ms. Freeman has really supported me a lot over the past years. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain that I wouldn't be as far as I am today without her and all of the education surrounding the SDGs. But thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Our next speaker is William Bertolotti. Um, please, William, if you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Thanks again for this opportunity to just meet all of you and to just share some ideas on the, uh, the Story Maps tool. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. And here we are. All right. Um, so let, let me know if this isn't being shown. But I titled um, this part of the presentation, every classroom has a story maps on ramp. And I see story maps as an incredible tool. And it's an on ramp because traditionally there's there are concerns where, oh, we have this novel technology. How do I incorporate this into my classroom? What potential does it have to disrupt how I already work with my students in my classroom environment? And what's incredible about the story maps platform is, if there's a show and there's a tell in your curriculum, you can work this in. And so what's incredible, we've seen so many examples this morning of how story maps can empower the communication of information. And so I provided two examples for you. Um, the first one being a seminar course where students who are exploring the SDGs, we started off with uh, a resource compendium um, that followed along a work by Dr. Jeffrey Sachs on sustainable development. And from there, we found a cool, a great article by Hardin on the tragedy of the commons. And the students were challenged to both find evidence for the tragedy and identify means by which they might surmount the tragedy. So some examples of the student work were one student was really interested in food justice equal access to quality nutrition. And she wanted to explore the distribution of fast food restaurants in the region. And Story Maps is a great way for her to plot all of these locations. And then from there, begin drawing her conclusions. Another student was really interested in democracy and global social justice and wanted to identify instances of, of large political demonstrations across the world. And what was cool about um, story maps is there's a feature that allows you to over time longitudinally display these events and now he's able to show right this within subject study of these types of events. In my individual student research program again here we have a tool for communication it's a great way to onboard um, story maps as a means for presenting information. And so one one student was interested in 
well, what role does nuclear power play in our transition to green energy? What is the state of nuclear power? And so using story maps, we can plot all the nuclear plants. And then from there, identify, well, what predictive factors will explain why these plants are located where they are? And I say that there's no ceiling to story maps because from there, students begin wondering, well, could I integrate some form of machine learning to identify the predictive factors, right? Another student who is interested in mapping the distribution of hospitals across New York State, right, to look for the equal, equal access to healthcare, right, is now starting to look into artificial intelligence to see whether or not we can predict what a more equitable distribution of hospitals might actually look like. So how, how do we get there? Um, maybe from my experience, I've identified two themes. One is engaging your own course and, and considering how, how can I implement some this tool for visualizing information and presenting that information in a narrative format? Is there one project or one activity that I can integrate story maps into, right? Again, we're not talking about a complete disruption of your course. We're, con we're, we're really considering some form of enrichment uh, for your students as a way to provide a more holistic learning opportunity. And so how can you, how, what types of data, right, could students integrate into their projects? I've hyperlinked sources of data that students can explore. Um, and really there is no limit. There's so much data out there. The other angle is working from the students' interests, right? And so this is a great way for students to see that this type of tool can promote their own form of expression and even their identity. So any project involving local history, local geography, my school, my town, my community, my state, right? Uh, mapping current events that are really important, especially current events that are evolving over time and even autobiographical mapping, right? How has my life changed but geographically and temporally? And what's really cool is both approaches allow students to practice the really important art of, I have this wealth of information, I have so much data, how do I become a curator of these data so that I can tell the most effective story to the public? Okay, so how, what considerations should um, the facilitator have when onboarding a story maps project? Um, from experience, I, I do recommend rubrics just so that students can understand, well, what are some baseline expectations for a strong story maps? Um, provide students examples of student work as models so that they can see, right, what kind of incredible work are my fellow students creating? And what can I do? What sources of inspiration can I leverage? Um, and then um, from a pedagogical standpoint, uh, allow yourself for some time where there is a workshop or portfolio environment, the workshop setting where students differentiate between different roles, students are afforded time to work, and the portfolio environment so that students have the time to see their work evolve. And that brings my presentation to a close. Again, Story Maps has been such a fulfilling and enriching tool for, for the classroom. And I feel that as a baseline mode of student communication and ownership, it's a great tool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. And both from you and from Betsy, we get to, you make it sound so simple. And I hope that we are all able to do this and, you know, integrate uh, a lot of what you do so easily into our classrooms, into our families and using these tools so that we can educate our kids. So thank you for sharing those um, uh, fantastic ideas on how to integrate uh, story maps using uh, you know, again, discussions in the classrooms uh, as well. So thank you for uh, doing that. Uh, over to another element that we want to focus on. So this was the teacher elements element where we were trying to integrate story maps into the classrooms. And uh, Ms. Freeman and Ms. Bertolo, did, I think, did a fantastic job of giving us a glimpse of how it is all possible using an integrated approach. Uh, over to... Uh, David Blockstein, who has been using uh, climate education to roll it out to not just one country or one classroom, but to multiple countries across uh, continents. So we can take these ideas of story maps and actually roll it to many, many uh, countries um, as well. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Bard College and he is uh, focusing on worldwide teaching uh, for climate and justice. 
So over to uh, David for his call for action and uh, getting a glimpse of uh, what he sees this academic year to be. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. And and thank you very much for your uh, inspiring work, uh, truly inspiring. In, in listening to Ms. Freeman's um, presentation and, and talking about uh, the, uh, the barriers of, of time and uh, overcoming the, uh, the gap in student learning from the pandemic, it makes me think that really there are um, two key elements to, to learning. Um, one is that students learn when they're interested in the content. And if there's something that they want to learn about, they're going to pay attention and they're going to learn. And then secondly, they're going to learn um, when there's good teaching. And so tools like the story maps and the turn it around cards and the other interactive components were discussed um, today, I think fit right in with that. So I want to very briefly um, introduce something that will actually be launched um, this week at the uh, Climate Week uh, um, New York City. Um, and that is that Bard College and um, the National Wildlife Federation <clears throat> are working together to launch a new campaign that we're calling um, Teach 10 Hours for Climate. And the idea is relatively simple that right now, uh, as we know, climate change, climate solutions, climate justice, sustainable development are really a very small part of the curriculum in, in most uh, education. And that's true around the world. And so <clears throat> what we are doing is we're challenging teachers to teach, administrators to um, present their curriculum, and students in their own learning to pledge to teach and learn 10 hours about the climate, about climate change, about climate solutions, and about climate justice over this academic year. So between now and Earth Day, one wouldn't think that that's a lot of time, um, <clears throat> you know, that we really ought to be spending at least 10 hours to be learning about the uh, existential uh, challenges that we're facing. Um, we have a, a pledge, and I put the link in our um, to the the pledge on our um, in the chat. And um, there's also a, a toolkit the teachers and administrators and students can use <clears throat> to plan their ten hours. And then at the center of that is our worldwide teach-in on climate and justice. I won't um, go into any of that in detail, but just the idea to have take a, within those 10 hours, take a day around the end of um, the uh, um, end of April, um, beginning of, or I'm sorry, end of March, beginning of April, to have a focused event bringing um, educators and students and community members together to talk about what climate justice looks like in their community and how to move together. We'll be having our introductory um, webinar explaining that this Wednesday um, at 10 a.m. New York time and also at 9 p.m. New York time. And then we'll be having continuing professional development, <clears throat> excuse me, at those same times every Wednesday. So please join us if you can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. I think this is a call for action for everyone, students and teachers both. So I think this is a great segue into just for, just mentioning about Mission 4.7's uh, platform, where we have a lot of uh, case studies, we have a lot of uh, lesson plans, and I would urge all the students here, eco ambassadors here, to send us your ideas of what you want to learn, your own lesson plans, so that we can put up those lesson plans um, on our website and also call for our teachers here. Please use the turn it around cards. Please use the story maps and see how we can uh, uh, share these lesson plans across different uh, you know, um, boundaries here. Of course, climate has no boundary and it is impacting everyone. Uh, so I think it's time to share 
lesson plans, story boards, story ideas, story maps, as well as uh, uh, participating on the events call for at least 10 hours of teaching uh, of climate related topics. Uh, with that, we'll end our session, but one last segment is remaining, which is on uh, the Earth Sustainability Network at, at uh, Arizona State University. We we'll play that video. And um, it is not, a, or I guess, I don't want to end the session by saying that let's end the session and not think about it. I think let's keep reflecting on what we did so far, what we heard from our eco ambassadors and see how can we, to Aluna's, Aluna's point, how can we think of it as like a crisis within and how are, what are those tools that we need to use to express our uh, collective wisdom here. So let's continue with that and uh, over to uh, the next session with the, with the video. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, we are the Sustainable Earth Team and we're going to be talking to you today about our content creation process and a little bit about our media storytelling. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get some introductions started. My name is Stormy Light. I'm a junior at Arizona State University studying sustainability and political science, getting a minor in Spanish. And I personally really became interested in storytelling at a young age. I would wake up early Saturday mornings, um, caffe caffeine in hand, and I would go out and track down the local businesses, politicians, um, students doing really exciting things in the community and talking about sustainability and civic engagement. And now I am really excited to be on the Sustainable Earth team, continuing my passion for storytelling and sustainability. And I will pass it off to James. Hey guys, uh, my name is James Cobb and I'm a second year graduate student at Arizona State University and I'm getting my master's degree in sustainability solutions. And before coming back to school, I was working in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. And so I have storytelling at the core of who I am. It's what I, it's what I do, it's why I wake up in the morning. And just like all of you, I have a passion for trying to make the world a better place. And I'm striving to bring together two awesome and powerful things, um, sustainability and storytelling. And where Stormy and I work right now at Sustainable Earth actually gives us the opportunity to do just that, which is really exciting. Um, and we are excited to share with you the power of storytelling and how you can actually harness that power yourself. Um, so Stormy and I, throughout this presentation, we'll take you through who and what Sustainable Earth is, uh, do a deep dive into our creative sprint process, and then we will take a virtual field trip to our Sustainable Earth website. And then we will hear from Allison Wolf at the Sustainable Teachers Academy. So what is Sustainable Earth? Uh, we are a new grant funded website, and we actually just launched this past year, which is pretty exciting. And uh, we try to create educational actionable materials um, with the great minds here at ASU and then broadcast them beyond Arizona and beyond the ASU network to our global audience. And we have three um, main target audiences and those are educators, small businesses and the sustainability curious public. And within these audiences, we have more specific in-depth personas that we will actually describe a little bit later on in the presentation. So who is on the Sustainable Earth team? Well, we are a collective of ASU students, faculty, and staff from Arizona State University with various creative talents in sustainable storytelling, um, media, graphic design, sustainability solutions. And what's really unique about our team is that we're almost entirely student run. So we are uh, mainly built up of graduate and undergraduate students. And we have our fearless leader, Kate, who guides us throughout our sprint process, which we'll get to later on in our presentation. And so as a team of mostly students, we have a really unique perspective on the stories that we wanna share, the type of 
stories uh, and how we want to share them and how we want to broadcast them to our audience. And so when I personally first joined Sustainable Earth, I was really impressed by the variety of backgrounds that we had um, and talents on our team. And even though we're a very small team, um, we definitely pack a punch and we have a our variety of talents and backgrounds actually really allow us to um, explore different sustainability topics and it actually works better for our team in general. And as and as a team, we don't have all of the experience in, in every area. And so this is where we prioritize making connections with our contributing partners. And uh, here on the screen, you can see a few of our uh, contributing partners that we work with to share new and existing resources. And if you're interested in contributing or partnering with us, we are always looking for ways to meet the needs of our content uh, with contributing partners. So now I'm gonna share um, a few of the various components to our site and how our diverse scope of work um, really allows us to connect to a greater audience in general. So our videos created by our amazing team allow us to form greater connections to visual learners. Um, and we use creative transitions and graphics um, and subject matter experts to relay this important sustainability concepts to our audiences. Um, secondly, we have articles, um, which is really critical for our site in showcasing sustainable solutions in a way that ends up being actionable, um, and which we'll get to when we do our sustainable field trip at the end of this presentation. And then we have our classroom activities, our games. We have some really fun games coming out um, soon, so stay tuned for those. And our educator and small business awards, um, which we'll also expand on later on in this presentation. Okay, so this is really exciting for us. This is our Google Venture Sprint process. So the Google Sprint process is was originally created for businesses for idea creation, um, prototyping, and we have taken the core ideas and methods um, used in this, and we have kind of molded this and transformed this into a creation machine for deciding on the topics that we want to choose and how we want to execute them, um, the stories that we want to tell. So essentially, we ask, what are we talking about? Um, who are we talking to? What subject matter experts do we really want to target for um, our sprint process? Um, what are the stories that are relevant for our readers. And so the Google Sprint process has really allowed our team of um, creatives to work collaboratively, um, and it really highlights task management, ideation, and problem solving in a group setting. So whenever you're, you're telling a story, it's very important to know who you're talking to. Uh, it's just as important as the story that you're telling. So if you're telling a story to your best friend, it's going to be so different than if you're telling a story to your teacher or your parents, right? So that's what we try to do whenever we're creating content as well as know, know who our audience is. And so you can see over on the left-hand side, we have Responsible Rick, Tiffanacious Tony, Conscious Carmen, and Engaged Elizabeth. And these are the, the personas that we're trying to make our, our content for. Um, but over on the right-hand side, you can really see how in-depth that we get with who we're, we're talking to and why we're trying to tell a story to them. Um, so we have pain points and challenges that we're trying to fill, um, objective, objectives and questions that we can answer. And then, you know, the relevant content, really understanding the relevant content to these specific people that we are trying to, uh, to communicate with and tell stories to. And so um, what exactly does the sprint process for Sustainable Earth look like? Um, and I'll walk you through the, the food system sprint that we completed last summer. And the goal of the sprint uh, was to create five pieces of content over the course of three weeks, which is a pretty quick turnaround, but it's very exciting. And so basically, we started with a large single idea of food systems. Uh, and then that first week, we did some research um, on, on different topics. And then we had our sprint day. And that's what this table down here um, is. You can see up on the, on the right-hand side, that was us in the room. And we put the sprint up on the whiteboard. It was really fun. But then we actually you know, made it more organized here in this table. And so we have our content type and um, the audiences that's going to be the persona, uh, who is the lead, the, the article and the purpose, and the calls to action. And I think it's very important that we had a call to action because we want people to act on these, these stories that we're, we're trying to tell. Um, so once we do the sprint day and we figure out exactly who we're talking to and why we're talking to them, um, then we actually go into creating our content. We sit down with subject matter experts and create our first drafts. And that's in the second week. And then finally, in the third week, we review everybody's um, different pieces of content uh, on the team. And then we we polish those and then put them up for our posting schedule. Oh, 
Awesome. Thanks, James. Um, now we're going to be going into our Sustainable Earth Educator Awards, also known as the SIAs. So based on our analytics, we have a lot of teachers coming to our website looking for educational materials, lesson plans, and resources that they can use in the classroom. And so we wanted to curate um, a place to gather these lesson plans. And so we received submissions from educators all across the United States, incorporating sustainability into their classrooms in a really unique way. And our team looked carefully through these awards, um, these submissions. We awarded $20,000 to educators prioritizing sustainability initiatives in their classroom. And so these lesson plans um, that will be featured on our site are actually used as a method of storytelling um, itself because we're able to inspire other teachers to take action um, through these lesson plans. And so in the blogs that we will be posting shortly to our website, um, showcasing these teacher tested lesson plans, we will use this as an opportunity to explain what sustainability development goals are being covered because this is also a really critical point to our site as well as we really like to talk about the sustainable development goals. So if you are currently an educator um, who is interested interested in participating in the SIAs um, and are interested in this process, we will be opening up applications next year um, for those of you who are interested in applying. And now is the time where we will be going on our Sustainable Earth virtual field trip. So now I will share my screen to the Sustainable Earth website. So this is our beautiful a uh, homepage for our website. And as you can see um, on the right-hand side, we have our small business resources. So this is our sustainability courses. We have um, credentials that you're able to earn and our small business awards, which are the says buzz. Um, under learn, we have videos and I'll just show you a little bit about, um, as James had mentioned earlier, we did that sprint process. This is what a video that came out of that sprint process recently. We did a fast fashion um, sprint um, and talked about sustainable fashions. So that was really great. And Ritesh put this video together for us. We have our articles. Um, yet again, another sustainable fashion article um, written by Laura. And so we really try to incorporate the sprint process into everything that we do. We have our classroom activities. Um, we have our games. We have a really exciting um, game coming in October. So stay tuned for that. And then we have our educator awards, which is what I went over um, previously. And then about, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, what we do as a team, who we are, please check out our mission, our team, and our about section. But this is where, where we really want everyone to go to is this shiny blue button, Take Action. So the Take Action page essentially allows you to join our mailing list, stay up to date on challenges, articles, videos, um, what's coming out and the exciting new content that we have featured. And then all the way down here, we have our sustainable development goals. So this really allows us to connect our audience to the 2030 um, Agenda for Sustainable Development um, and talk a little bit about that. And so this is really just the tip of the iceberg um, for our website. There are a lot of awesome materials that we have featured um, on here. So when you have the time after this presentation, please check out our website. Um, we are gonna be having some really great articles, videos, resources um, featured on here. So now, I will pass it off to Allison with the Sustainable Teachers Academy. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation um, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you so much everyone. We hope you have taken all the tips from our session about the storytelling about creative writing, about sustainable development goal, and how it can be integrated to the teaching and learning experience. Sorry right, for the feedback. So to 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 end the session. To end the session, uh, we wanted to just leave you with our very last kind of call, um, something exciting to look forward to for the fall, um, which is uh, Fridays for Future uh, work that we're going to do. We're gonna be inviting all of our, through our Eco Ambassador Network, a lot of speakers, a continuation of everything that we have discussed in today's uh, webinar. 
um, to really stay connected with our networks. You know, uh, David and Radhika have shared some of the steps forward, some considerations. All of our students and teachers today have given us so much to think about. So it will be a continuation of these conversations so that every Friday uh, we are getting together um, to talk about how to really implement all that we have talked about, all the inspiration that we got, all the trainings that we're getting, how do those things can be better implemented and incorporated to our classrooms and to our networks. Um, so we'll, you'll see more information on that. It will be starting in November. You can find the updates in our Twitter account. We'll be using that as our primary way of communicating with you um, the, the Fridays for Future details at ed4sd, ed4sd. Um, thank you everyone so much for, share, uh, for joining today and we will stay connected with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>